Welcome to Dividing Lines, a series of special programs from the Near Futurist, where we'll be bringing together respected innovators and thinkers to examine some of the most consequential debates in technology and society today. Dividing Lines is powered by Diffusion, an award-winning international PR agency on a mission to help tech innovators to take on the status quo and transform the future faster. My name is Guy Clapperton. The world is increasingly hungry and food is distributed unevenly. COVID-19 hasn't helped, of course, but there was an underlying issue anyway. And one potential solution is to take the concept of farming and put it on different levels, literally farming different crops on different floors of a big building. And that's what we call in the trade a gross, crude oversimplification of an idea. And luckily, we have an expert in our midst who can explain it properly, and also a chef who's more than a little skeptical about the idea. First, our expert is a sustainability strategist focused on urban agriculture, water issues and emerging technologies. In 2014, he responded to a global need for technology agnostic guidance on urban agriculture by launching the advisory firm Agritecture Consulting, which has now consulted on over 150 urban agriculture projects in over 25 countries. He is Henry Gordon Smith. Our other guest is a chef who graduated in biochemistry from Manchester University and worked his way up through professional kitchens. Frustrated by pseudoscience and misinformation in the food industry, in 2016 he started a blog called The Angry Chef and is a best-selling author. His latest book, Ending Hunger, A Quest to Feed the World Without Destroying It, discusses the sustainability of our modern food systems, exploring how myths and misconceptions in this area are the greatest barrier to progress. He is Anthony Warner. Welcome to you both. Hello. So, hey, Guy. Uh, Hi, thank you very much indeed for coming. And so, Henry, if I could start with you, I feel as if I described this so-called vertical farming very crudely and quite probably wildly and accurately. What can you tell us about the idea? Yeah, it's no problem that it was difficult to define. It's been difficult for the sector itself to define it. But the Association for Vertical Farming a few years ago surveyed its members. And vertical farming is essentially defined as using three-dimensional space for agriculture. So this is typically done indoors using hydroponic and non-soil based systems where you stack cultivation levels above each other and you use artificial lighting generally to light them. There are some applications of vertical farming that are greenhouses that use a hybrid between artificial light and natural light, but the vast majority of them tend to be going towards sort of warehouses that are these hydroponic systems and are producing this. Now, we can talk about the reasons why they would do that, but that's the typical definition of vertical farming as it's being manifested today. Well, thanks very much for clarifying that. Can you tell us something about where it actually exists rather than just being an idea on paper and how it's performing both commercially and in terms of consumer reaction? Yeah, it's important to sort of look back at history a little bit, right? So vertical farming is an evolution of controlled environment agriculture, which includes greenhouses and any sort of indoor research chambers. Even a lot of cannabis production happens indoors with artificial lights. This is all controlled environment agriculture. Now, in the 1980s, NASA wanted to explore how they could grow food in space. You can imagine shipping all the food astronauts need is very expensive and heavy. Uh, heavy equals expensive in space. So they said, let's see what we can do to grow in greenhouses or in hydroponic systems. And that's where really the beginning of modern vertical farming came from, the technology. They grew potatoes, they grew wheat, they grew all kinds of fruits and vegetables for the astronauts. It wasn't really until the 90s that in Japan, in the face of contamination in the ground, that plant factories, which is the Japanese name for vertical farms, started emerging. Warehouses that would grow leafy greens and be marketed as clean, radiation-free. This was also a response to the fact that Japan ran out of space, and so there was no more forest that could be cut down for agriculture. So they needed to go vertical. And then really, it wasn't until 2010 when Dr. Dixon de Pommier, my mentor at Columbia University, published the book, The Vertical Farm, that this new era, this internet phenomenon of vertical farming, largely driven by hype and utopian ideas, started creating all these different businesses around the vertical farming sector. And many of them failed, I would say, in the early 2010s through until now. But now we're in a different stage where rapid investment has come into the sector. So we're seeing vertical farms, a lot of activity across the Middle East, across the United States, across places like China, Singapore, Japan continually. And also we're seeing in extreme climates as well. In Europe, a little bit less established, I would say, due to the fact that there's already an abundance of local and affordable food in most places in Europe. Okay, Anthony, if I could bring you in there. It 
sounds a lot like a sort of win-win situation. Should all growers be adopting this as a method? Should we, should we be looking at this in Europe, do you think? I don't think there's any reason why we shouldn't be looking at it in Europe in certain areas. I guess my reservations, I think I'd call them, would be more when this gets sort of touted as being a real sort of panacea for the problems of agriculture. I'm very interested in how we address the problems of agriculture. And obviously there are lots of wins for um, vertical farming. You know, you use less land. Um, you can produce in urban centres where, where production is difficult. You can grow plants more quickly. And you can really control the input, you control the amount of fertiliser going in, you can control, you, know, you don't have the sort of same problems with runoff, and which creates sort of algal blooms, and, and you use far less water. And I think water is going to become, water use is going to become increasingly important in agriculture in the next sort of 10, 20, 30 years. And, you know, there are, as I said, there are lots of benefits, but the big issue with vertical farming is its carbon footprint. And, you know, for me, it's very difficult to get over that. Um, You know, obviously, when we look at agriculture, we have to look at a whole series of metrics, but carbon footprint is obviously extremely important. You know, we have the IPC. See report out today and you know global warming is, is the greatest issue perhaps facing humanity and, and very difficult to get over the carbon impact you look at a kilogram of lettuce in a vertical farm it probably produce or, or but i should actually just clarify that as being more of an indoor farm i mean it produces um about four kilograms of co2 for the lighting alone without the sort of in building the infrastructure and it's without sort of other costs of, of humidity control ventilation and, and cooling and, and, and those sort of issues um, and that's probably between 10 and 20 times as much carbon footprint as you would have for outdoor production. And, then, and also that adds an enormous amount of cost. And so you're really looking at vertical farming only ever really being suitable for a very small number of high value crops such as sort of, um, lettuce and, and microbes, which is fine and which is interesting and perhaps something to look at in the entirety of agriculture. But as soon as this sort of technology starts getting suggested as a panacea, I, I start to get really worried because, you know, you, the, the, the sun, energy from the sun is this sort of enormous source of free energy. And, and we shouldn't get sort of blinded by by technology and think this is the future because farming and feeding the world and, and sort of making sure that people around the world have enough to eat will always be dependent on, on farmers working in fields and harnessing the energy of the sun. And I don't see any way around that. I don't think we're ever going to get to a point where vertical farms are producing the sort of staple crops like um, like wheat and rice which really feed the world there'll be high value crops probably for wealthy people in urban centers which has a place but is, is not a cure for the environmental harms of agriculture i come back to henry on that high value crops so uh, essentially luxury foodstuffs the huge carbon footprint what's your response to that yeah, I think that there's great points made. And at Agritecture, we really embrace that there's no one size fits all. Vertical farming is on the extreme of technology for agriculture. And as a result of that, has applications only in certain settings. But that doesn't mean it has in every setting. So it's really from a design perspective, you have to say, how are you matching the problem with the right solution? And many, many vertical farmers are not matching those things up properly. I get people coming to me and I say, this is your business plan. This is what you want to grow. You should build a greenhouse or you should build an outdoor farm. And some of them really need the education to understand why a vertical farm wouldn't make sense because it is touted as this panacea, which is incorrect. It is marketed as the best way to do this and feeding the world, which is not correct either. But there are places, as Anthony mentioned, to apply it. So let's talk about that. You know, when we look at the, at the United States, right, if we look at New York City and the Eastern Seaboard, where the majority of the US population is located, 93% of the greens, the leafy greens that come to that location come from Arizona and California. And most of the rest comes from Mexico. So when we talk about the abundance of sunlight, it's true, it's free, it's abundant, but there are other things that are created in conventional agriculture, field agriculture, that create a lot of waste. We see 30 to 40% of the product wasted before it reaches the plate. Vertical farming is an incredible response to that specific problem. When you produce in vertical farms close to the consumer, you can deliver leafy green products, microgreens as well, but not just that, herbs, leafy greens, now moving into strawberries, directly to the consumer, no matter what time is year, within 24 hours from farm to plate or less. So that is an advantage, and that has a lot of advantages from a, an environmental perspective over reducing the distance from farm to plate, the food miles from that distance, and the waste, which is an even more significant GHG emissions 
impact than the food miles itself is that waste that's created. When that waste product occurs, we're not only using losing all the resources, the water and the fertilizer that were put into the ground for that plant, but the infrastructure that was intended for irrigating that farm, as well as the waste that comes from, you know, and the emissions that come from that waste. So it, there's a lot of aspects of it, but I will say that unless a vertical farm is powered by renewable energy, it cannot market itself as sustainable. It could say it's part of a sustainable solution or it's in the process of getting there. But it's also interesting to see that there are farms that can be powered by renewable energy. Vertical farms in Canada are powered by hydroelectric energy. You can say what you want about that, but that is moving to a direction of a more renewable source of energy. Our client Dream Harvest in Texas is 100% renewable powered. We've got farms that are choosing to pay extra to source from that to make sure that their mission aligns with their impact. So I think it's really about where in the world can you have vertical farms be viable. If you look in the Middle East, right? If you go to Saudi Arabia, you would see kale that's shipped in from California. That's just simply ridiculous. And vertical farming as an emerging technology, I would say is not primarily about mitigating climate change. It's about adapting to climate change. The temperatures are gonna get worse. The extreme climate is gonna get worse. There's million, billions of dollars happening across the United States alone and damage due to climate change. So vertical farming presents an opportunity to grow consistently using less water, using less land. And in some markets that can be more sustainable in certain conditions. But broadly speaking, I agree with Anthony. I think we've given both sides of that a fair hearing. I'd like to have a look at the consumer side. Anthony, you're a chef. And uh, my impression is a lot of consumers, uh, when they can afford it, I may be talking about the luxury side again, are very concerned about the provenance of their food and where it comes from. Do you have any experience or uh, instinct as to how likely how they are likely to react to food grown in this way? Yeah, I think it's probably um, there's a double edged sword for these sort of products. The first thing is obviously people do are drawn to local produce and are drawn to reducing food miles. I mean, I, I always question the um, the validity of, of food miles as, as a sustainability metric on produce. It tends to be, transport tends to be really quite a low part of the impact of most, like the climate impact of most foods. I mean, the exception probably being some air freighted produce, which I guess um, it, the vertical farms might be pretty good at producing those sort of high value ingredients that tend to get air freighted around i I think we should should get away from using air freight for food so i think that there's potential there um you know but but i I always i do worry about the food miles metric but people are drawn to it people do do think like to buy stuff that's grown locally people like to buy stuff that's grown within within their local area and that that can be a really good thing in 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 many respects I, i i think we should always be wary of um being going too far down that line we don't because you tend to get into this sort of everything should be grown locally slightly autarkic um sort of uh, ideas around food which i think are sort of reasonably poisonous and dangerous in, in many respects but that said you know there is something to be said for saying i know for some of the stuff i'm buying i know my local producer it's produced within, within my area so i think that can be a really good thing and, and it can motivate consumers what doesn't motivate consumers is a feeling that what's being produced is somehow unnatural and, and i'm you know i'm in all in favor of technology in, in food and within our food system so, and i i tend to try and reject these sort of ideas but people don't like really uh, the, the use of technology in this way people like to think of the, the, the food they're eating as being produced in some sort of natural way and have this idea of what natural looks like and, and so you know i think um vertical farms are probably have a difficult line to tread really between those two things between the idea the idea that something is grown locally and the idea that production might feel to consumers to be sort of unnatural um you know when they look at sort of a big 10-story building and um, producing their their food they might sort of not be very drawn to that as opposed to something grown um, in a way that they feel is more natural on the field. Those are probably sort of misconceptions by consumers, but they're, they're pretty powerful ones that tend to motivate a lot of consumer choice. Do you want to sound as confident as my interviewee in this episode? If you talk to the press or other media, are you worried you'll be misquoted, or they'll just publish their story and not yours? Clapperton Media Associates can help with coaching. Drop me a note, guy at clapperton.co.uk, and we'll arrange a time for an exploratory call. Now, back to the podcast. (music) 
Yeah, I was going to say, immediately we're doing something like eating a banana in the UK. We're doing something unnatural. We've had to import it. We cannot possibly grow that in this climate. So is is it a matter of a line being drawn somewhere, possibly arbitrarily, in the minds of the consumers, do you think? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, you know, obviously we have a lot of imported produce in the UK, as well, probably more actually the UK, probably has more than most countries in terms of the amount of our calories that we import, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I, you know, like I said, I'm, I worry about if we try to get too much around this sort of um, nationalistic ideas around food production. But, you know, things like bananas and that sort of produce, we do accept those imports. And actually, if you look at the climate impact of that, most of them are sort of slow freighted by boats around the world. The climate impact is not that great. I think the UK food transportation probably I said, accounts for about 10 maybe 12% of the climate impact of our food, which is not that huge. And actually, if we try to bring too much production back into the UK and grow a lot of stuff in hot houses and had really high energy, we would actually increase the climate impact of our food. So I think we need to be careful not to get too drawn down that line of local production of being the panacea. My writing generally looks at everything that's that's held up as a panacea for the environmental impact of food and, and says it's just not that simple. And I think that's what we see in, in, in all of these sort of issues. I think that's absolutely right. And I have to say that Henry has not said this is a panacea. He's decidedly no, no, not agreed with you. There's no such, <laughs> no such thing. It's, you're right to shoot that down as a concept out there. I just want to... Yeah, and I think broadly speaking, we agree. But, you know, I think um, Henry would also admit, and I think he did earlier, that there are people around who are holding these sort of like vertical farming as a panacea for all of agriculture and eventually will be producing wheat and rice and, and those sort of products in vertical farms. And we, yeah. we must make sure we get away with that. We must make sure we don't sort of devalue what sort of farmers are doing in the field all around the world and doing, you know, not, not understand the value of that work and how that those sort of farmers working in fields will always be the ones who are feeding humanity perhaps vertical farms can provide part of that system but i think there's a real danger a lot of advocates getting too carried away with this sort of technology henry i don't think you yeah, I, disagree with any of that to be honest you haven't uh, uh, you, well you haven't, i mean i think uh, suggested I, otherwise I, I, I'm interested, yeah. though, what the uh, what the consumers have said to you about food produced in this way. And of course, please respond to Anthony's point. Yeah, so we agree that any I think any promotion of a panacea, whether it's organic agriculture or conventional agriculture, I mean, there just is no panacea in general in agriculture. And in fact, there's been a consolidation in general in the food system that I think warrants a step back to say, what else can we do? How else can we do it? And vertical farming is still, I would say, in a semi-experimental stage. It's, it's really just getting out of its experimental stage into prime time, where we're starting to see some commercialization and some meaningful impact in certain areas. I want to be clear that I think that it's not the food miles, meaning the fuel that's used to transport the product. It's the waste in the conventional agricultural system that is more significant than that. That I think that is a very important part of it. And we're actually seeing a lot of data that says that there's even more farm waste than we expected. And so I think that is an important aspect of this. I still think, again, that vertical farms tend to have a higher carbon footprint. I wouldn't say it's 20. It really depends on where it is. But by our calculations, depending on which context you're in, it's five to 10 times higher. So there is room for that to improve as the technology is improving rapidly. I think it's really important to think about the consumers. First of all, the one thing is like when people tell me <laughs> it's not natural, right? I speak at a lot of panels. I speak about this. I say, you know, can you tell me when was agriculture ever natural? Like when was it natural? Was it was it the moment we didn't start to organize it into rows? Was it the moment we started to control the direction of the plants or pick certain things that would grow together. What was the moment where we started doing that? You can't oppose technology overall, right? Because that's how we've been able to feed everyone so far. So it's really, technology is always a double-edged sword, right? You you do something and you'd get another trade-off. And so it's really about stepping back and having a more sophisticated analysis that there are case-by-case settings to consider. There's a lot of challenges in many different types of agriculture. And I think that vertical farming presents a solution in some of those contexts and it's getting better over time. So for the consumers, you know, when someone eats, let's you're a chef, Anthony, you know, our client farm one is a vertical farm in Manhattan. It's in a basement. It's not a, some 10 story building necessarily, but it's in a basement. It's, it delivers only to consumers within 30 minutes and chefs. They serve Michelin star restaurants which do actually import a lot of products by plane because they want the right flavor and the right quality and the right thing for their customers. But as they want to move away from that, what choices do they have to still have their variety? Well, Farm One presents an alternative. 
where they can actually meet with the farmer in Manhattan, can request certain things, and they're growing 500 different varieties of edible flowers and plants for these chefs. And the customers, the chefs themselves, are obsessed with it. They love it. Farm One has sold out of its first farm, sold out of its second farm, and is just opening its third farm now in Brooklyn. And they also deliver to customers. They deliver in a way with zero single waste plastic. You get a reusable container for your salads, and then you return it and you get another one. That is a premium experience. There's no doubt about it. But that's what they love about it. They love the premium experience. They love the flavor. But any vertical farm product, I think if you try arugula or lettuce, if the grower is good, the freshness is such a big driver for that taste. You can tell me natural all the time, right? You can say consumers want natural, but what they really want is delicious flavor and freshness. And it's very hard to beat the freshness of a vertical farm product in the winter where you can taste like it just came out of the garden. And the flavor really is powerful. And the chefs are saying it themselves. You can look at numerous chefs across the world that are working with vertical farming companies that support the product and are excited about it. So I think, you know, the proof is in the flavor. Anthony, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I would agree. I, I would agree um, wholeheartedly with, with any idea that, well, any pushback against the fact that that, that sort of growing is unnatural because, you know, it's, it's, I just think it's a manipulated concept that people use and they misunderstand. And like you said, farming is just a really unnatural thing to do generally. And, and that, that word gets twisted. I just think that's something that consumers might push back against. I'm not saying it's a, you know, a negative at all. They do. They do. Yeah. Absolutely. In certain markets. You're right. And, and I, I see that. All over, I see that all over the place within food generally. You know, uh, the, the term "natural" is disingenuously used all the time, and and it's quite a powerful, powerful concept in consumers' minds. So, you know, there's something to that the industry will, will have to address and understand that sort of consumer pushback, and understand there'll be lobbyists around who push back. You know, organic agriculture has a number of lobbyists who, who do that sort of work, and, and um, vertical farming feels, I think, to consumers to be a, a million miles away from sort of organic in quotes natural farming from the land uh, and and people might push back at that but you know in terms of these sort of high value products which can be available to um, chefs and consumers a very short time after being harvested i think that there's value there and there's obviously interesting businesses there but you know like i said it's not going to be something which is really addressing um the climate and environmental impacts of agriculture but it's an interesting development and an interesting business and, and in terms of flavor and, and quality i think that that's there's a lot of power in that, which is obviously something that matters to me as a chef. I'm not <laughs> completely averse to, to people um, paying high value for, for delicious food. One thing I would sort of think I think is worth considering is this issue of food waste. My understanding of food waste figures probably come from the UK. And I think our food system is pretty efficient in terms of minimizing waste until the food gets into the home in, in this country, certainly. And most waste tends to occur within the home you know our, our agriculture our farmers are pretty good at minimizing food waste i mean you know on the field and the vast majority of our food waste tends to occur in consumers homes and, and tends to occur in people buying too much fresh produce and it, and it not and not actually making it onto the plate so i think we need, need to be very careful with how we address food waste and how we look at it and go rather than sort of blaming farmers and um, for or blaming conventional farming systems i think we need to consider the sort of the social reasons why why food waste occurs which is obviously a pretty um, complex issue and a, and a difficult thing to address but you know i i would well... i can just talk about that briefly though because this this point is a is an important one you know when you get product from the supermarket from conventional farms it's already been harvested and so it's wasting away from that harvest period and because of how long it was harvested and then stored in the retail store it's getting older so the waste at the consumer level also is connected to the farmer and the retailer because it's old, it's low quality. You're not going to eat something that's brown or that's losing its flavor or that isn't good. The reason why vertical farming reduces food waste isn't just the distance. It's also because of how fresh it is when you get it and how much longer it lasts. I was in Lisbon last week. I harvested from a vertical farm. I was able to store that living plant and keep it for seven days, completely fresh, and pull from that basil plant as long as I wanted. No problems. There was zero waste from the edible product in that because I had so much flexibility because the day I got it was the first day. So that's what I'm referring to. It's not just that the farmers are wasting on the fields, but it's really that the, the, the quality of that product is less, which means that there's more waste as well at home. 
I think we're going to have to draw this to a close, unfortunately, because of timing. I mean, there's huge issues out there. There's loads of people who think that their apples are completely fresh when they buy them, whereas actually they've been stored for months and they won't be any good unless they're stored for months because people don't necessarily understand how food works uh, all the time. But that's a separate debate. If I could just conclude by asking you both how any listeners who are interested can find out more about both of you and, uh, in Henry's case, your organization. Uh, Henry, tell me about uh, your contact points. So it's important to be a skeptic about agriculture in general. And Agritecture has created a software called Agritecture Designer, where you can estimate the capex yield, anything, energy of any greenhouse or vertical farm on earth. And you can put certain inputs in to adapt to your local conditions. We even are building a waste calculator to talk about this issue. Just go to design.agritecture.com. You can try it out for free and just look at the numbers for yourself. That's terrific. And Anthony, where can people get in touch? Where can they read your blog? The blog is, is the, the Angry Chef, and you can follow me on, on Twitter as um, One Angry Chef. Um, and obviously, um, my book um, on these issues on, on the sustainability of global agriculture and also on the sort of technologies required to feed the planet is Ending Hunger, The Quest to Feed the World Without Destroying It, which came out this year. And I have a couple of other books, but most, a lot of my other writing is about food and health and, and diet and that sort of thing. And uh, I'm in the middle of reading that book, and I can confirm that uh, the man can write, and I would recommend it wholeheartedly. Henry Gordon-Smith of Agrotecture and angry chef Anthony Warner, who sounded reasonably calm today, I'm almost disappointed to say, but thank you very much indeed for joining me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And many thanks to you for listening. That was the Near Futurist podcast with me, Guy Clapperton, and my guest in the second of the series of Dividing Lines, sponsored by Diffusion PR. Don't forget to have a look at the website at nearfuturist.co.uk or my media training site at remotemediatraining.com. I'll be back as always in two weeks time. Oh,